and especially if you live overseas, November has some special meaning to it because it's Thanksgiving, and um, it's kind of a nostalgic time as well. You think of the, the turkeys and the cherry pies and the apple pies, and it's just, it's just kind of nice. And so I'm really excited about Thanksgiving coming up. If you're a uh, Canadian, which I know a few of y'all are, you celebrate Thanksgiving in October. And uh, if you're from any other country in the world, you don't celebrate Thanksgiving at all. So anyways, but Pastor Homer decided that we would make November the month of thankfulness is, is our theme. Thankfulness because Thanksgiving and, and, and whatnot. So whether or not you're American or whether or not you're Canadian or wherever it is in the world that, that you're from, Thankfulness is something that we're all supposed to be as Christians. We're supposed to be thankful for, for all of God's blessings. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about an aspect of thankfulness. Next week, Alex is going to talk about something that has to do with thankfulness. And then the week after, Lee Wood is going to bring up a topic that also has to do with thankfulness. And so my topic this morning is the secret of contentment. The idea is that if we're not content with what we have, then we're not going to be thankful for what we have. So I'm, I'm coming at thankfulness from, from this vantage point, from, from contentment. And so we're going to be talking this morning about what is the source of your content? What is the source of your content? What is it that makes you <clears throat> content? So last year, I, uh, I, I purchased a bike, like a really, really, really nice bike. And so I've, I've grown up riding bikes all my life. I, I love to ride bikes. But last year I decided, you know what, it's time to take it to the next level. I want to take it from more of a recreational type of thing of getting around town to like more of a, a sporting type of level. And so I wanted to buy a bike, a road bike, something that would go really, really, really fast. And, um, and I, I'm married. And when, whenever Morgan and I, when we got married, we made a decision that any money that was mine was now hers. And any money, I, I'm not done yet, any money that was hers was, was mine. And, and so it's, it's our money. Uh, we're, we're a couple, we're married, it's not just mine, it's not just hers, it's, it's ours. And so with any major investment or any major purchase, we, 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 we decide together. And uh, so I had to go, go over to, Hun, to, to Morgan and say, Hun, um, I really want to get this road bike. And, and here are my reasons why. I need to have this road bike. And one, it's going to make me like way fitter than I've ever been. She's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's really, really good. And number, number two, um, it does cost a lot of money. But here's the deal. Like this bike is going to last me 10, 15, maybe 20 years. And so if you take the, the total amount that we're going to spend in a minute's time and you divide that by 20 years, like it's really not that expensive. And so, okay, okay. And, uh, and once I have this bike, I'll, I'll never need to spend any more money on it at all. Well, of course, that's not true. <laughs> and not only that, once I have this bike, I'm going to be really, really happy. And when you purchase something that's really nice, and you probably all have experienced this, no matter how much you've spent on this thing, after a while, it kind of loses its luster a little bit. Because... As you're out and about, somebody else has a slightly nicer bike than, than what you've got. Their bike is lighter, it's a little bit faster, it's, got, it's all carbon fiber, and, and it's got a cooler color, or it's the latest model, it's a little bit better than yours. And so what was once a, a source of pride and real enjoyment begins to look a little, well, not quite as nice as the other person's. And then... I began thinking, if I could just add one thing to my bike, if I could just do this one thing to it, then I'll be, I'll be happy again. And I, Pastor Homer and I, we were talking yesterday, whenever you, you go out biking, and Zach goes with, with us all the time too, like, you stop off at a 7-Eleven for a break on a, on a Saturday morning, and everybody is there who's out bike riding. And there are like some really, really nice bikes. And so you're always looking around like, wow, that's really cool. I kind of wish I had that, or I wish I had those wheels. That's just really nice. And, and my bike is just not quite as good as that person's bike. But if I allow this, this trend and this downward spiral to continue, and what, was once, what, what once made me happy actually begins to make me a little bit sad and a little bit disgruntled and a little bit envious, a little jealous of others. And there's a feeling inside me that I just don't have as much as that other person. So if I'm smart, 
I have to ask myself, okay, Mike, what is it going to take for you to be content with what you have? Because obviously the bike's not doing it for you. And that's what we're going to be asking ourselves today is what is the source of your contentment? And I imagine that if you're anything like me, you probably struggle with the same issue. Maybe not with a bike, but it could be with other things. And, uh, and, and I think, I think that, we, that we all do it. And Facebook is really, really good about bringing this out. Like, oh, man, she's got 6,000 friends, and I've only got 600 friends. If only I could have that many friends, then, then my life would be better. Or I love it when somebody goes on a vacation somewhere, and they post this really, like, to Fiji or something. They post this nice picture, and it's them on the beach, and at the bottom of the screen, you can see their toes kind of sticking out a little bit. And then in front of them, there's this beach... And, this, and it's crystal white sand, and then this really clear water, and then there's just this gorgeous sunset going on. And, uh, and, and then you, you look around where you're at, and you're in your office, and you're staring at these white walls or your cubicle or at home, and you're like, man, if only I could be Fiji. I'd be really, really happy. Or they've got the perfect family. You know, people always post the perfect family pictures on Facebook. Oh, they've really got it together. And our family, well, not, not so much. But it's different things for, for all of us, I think. It could be that you didn't get that job or that promotion or that raise that you really wanted. And so you feel disappointed. You feel a little bit of discontentment there. You might be a stay-at-home mom. And you see all these other women who've gone out and they started these careers and they're doing these things. And all of a sudden you feel like, Am I really doing what I should be doing? Like, maybe it'd actually be better if I, if I went out there and, and got a job as well. Or you might be the, um, somebody who's moved to Taiwan recently or in the last year or two, and as you've lived here, you realize it rains a whole lot in this town. Last week excluded because the weather was really nice. But the rain just seems to get socked in, and it rains for two, three weeks at a time, it seems like. Or it's hot, and it's humid, and you don't like the the culture or the language or the traffic or whatever it might be, and you think, man, if I could just finish up my assignment here and then move on to the next place, or if only I could go back home to where I was from, then I would be happy. Or you, or you might just be a striver, somebody who just constantly strives, a type A type of person. Like, if I get this, this, and this done and get everything perfect, then I'm going to be happy. Or you might be the type of person who's a self-promoter and you think, okay, if I can self-promote myself at work or at my job or wherever it is that I may be, and people could see this image, oh, wow, look at Mike. He's really got it all together. He really knows his stuff. He's got it down. He's going somewhere. If I could create that image and promote myself, then I'll be happy because I'll finally have the image that that I've always, always wanted. And so we strive, and we always want to get to the next level, education, job, the next $100,000, reputation, anything, you name it, we're always striving for it. And we know that we're not content because we make statements like, I won't be happy until you fill in the blank. Or I'll never be content until you fill in the blank. And you can also see it when you start saying, I, I wish I had this, or I wish this would happen, or I wish we could go there, or I wish, I wish, I wish, and we don't. We never reach that level of contentment. And it's interesting, I think, that we think if, if we could get that certain item or something would happen to us, then we would, we would be happy. But when we get to that point, we actually find out, oh, I'm not as happy as I, as I thought that I would be. So we, it's like we imagine ourselves going down this road of happiness. And when we get to the road, to the end, we're actually unhappy. And that's, that's an issue that we all face. And so... We've got to figure out, okay, what do we do about this problem? Where does the source of our contentment come from? And it's not just material items. It's not just jobs. Sometimes it's just situations of life where we're just discontent. Things are happening, and we don't know why, but it's not comfortable, and we'd really like to move on for that. It could be a wayward child. You've got a kid who's making decisions that are just really dumb. And if only they would figure things out, then we can move on and, and get better. Or kids not doing well at school, make a bad grade, or they haven't lived up to the expectations that you've had. It could be a loss in the family, financial mistake. It could be a major restructuring in, in, your, in your company or your organization. And when it's all said and done, you're not going to know where you're going to land. And so there's this, this unease in you. 
It could be a medical issue that just doesn't seem to go away or just some situation that makes you say, I can't wait to get out of this problem and this issue because I know that whatever comes next has got to be better than what I'm going through now. And we're just not content. We're not content with our circumstances, uh, with the things that we have. We're not content with our marriages and with our relationships. And there's this uneasiness in our hearts because we always want to get to the next best thing, the next best level, the next place, the next best person, the next relationship. And let's admit it. It's something we all do. We all struggle with. And, and psychologists have come up with this thing. It's called the, the hedonic treadmill. And hedonism or hedonic is just a, it's just a fancy word for pleasure. You say somebody's a hedonist, all they care about is pleasure and, and what benefits them. And we're all basically on this treadmill. All right, here's how it works. You see something and then you want it, you go out and you buy it, and then you feel happy. And then you adapt to it and it becomes a normal and then you get a little bit tired of it, and so then you say, then you see something else, and you want that, you get it, you're happy, but then it becomes normal again, and you go through the same cycle. And it's not just buying things, it's, it's situations or, or whatever it is in your life that you're facing. Oh, if only I could be over there, if we could move there, or we could have this, and, and we go out, we, we want it, and we, and we get it, we attain it somehow, and we're finally, I've made it, finally I'm happy, and then we adapt, and then we're not happy anymore. And so the question is, how do we get off of this treadmill? What should we do? And how do we get to the point in our lives where we can finally say, I'm content. Content, whatever I have, whatever situation I'm in, I am content. I'm so glad you asked. Actually, I'm really glad that I asked it for you because it's not a new problem. It's actually a very old problem. It goes, harks back to the very beginning of creation almost. When Adam and Eve were created, and not quite at that point, but there's a little, there's a story in the Bible where there's a talking snake that comes along into the garden, and I don't know how all that works, but the snake shows up and he talks to Eve and he says, Eve, you're not really happy, are you, with what you've got? I mean, you've got some good things here. Yeah, you're living in a garden and God walks with you and all that stuff, but I'll tell you something, actually, you're missing out on a little bit. And if you would just go to that tree that God told you not to eat anything of, of, if you'll just take that apple, you'll crunch into it, I will show you some wonderful things. And you will realize how unhappy that you actually are. And so Eve, she, the Bible says that, 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 that she saw it, that she went and she took it, she got, she took a, a, a bite, and, and her eyes were, were open. And so it's not just us who struggle with this. This is something that, humankind has struggled with. Your parents and your grandparents and all your ancestors, however far back your family tree goes, but to the very beginning, people have struggled with it. And then your kids and, and their kids and, and, and their kids and so on and so on and so on, they're going to struggle with the same issue as well is contentment. How do, we, how do I get content? And what is the source of our contentment? But fortunately, the Bible has a lot to say about this issue. And we're going to focus on one area uh, today, one passage of Scripture but there, in Rome, there's a, there's a town, it's called Philippi, and um, it's some, similar to Taiwan or to Taipei or wherever you're from in some ways, in that it was a pretty wealthy city. People have, lived there, they were affluent, they had, they had good, good means, good transportation. Actually, what I really liked about this is that uh, Rome designated a special city, and they said, hey, you guys don't have to pay taxes very often. Now, that's kind of a nice perk to live there. And I would love to have some extra cash. But they had some extra cash going because they're, they're, not, they're not paying any taxes. And so along comes the Apostle Paul, and he arrives in the city of Philippi. And it, this is one of the first places where he plants a church. And so he calls these people, they're, they're the Philippians. And Paul, he, he got kicked out of there. And if you know the story, that if you grew up in Sunday school, you probably know it. But it's Paul and Silas, and they're in jail, and they're singing, and, and there's an earthquake, and and the doors open, and they could have escaped, but they didn't. And the jailer comes in, and he wants to kill himself. And they say, no, 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 don't, don't, don't harm yourself. We're all here. That was in Philippi, okay? So if you want to connect that story there, that's where that happened. But even, eventually, Paul got, got uh, kicked out of, of there. But what Paul does is he goes around to different cities and towns, and he plants these churches, and then he ends up leaving. But he starts this letter-writing campaign, and he'll write to the church and say, hey, how are you doing? 
uh, what questions do you have for me? And they'll write him back, and they'll say, well, we've got these questions. And so he'll write them, them a letter back, and he'll address the questions in his letter. And so when we read Philippians, that's what's going on here. They, 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 they've corresponded over the years, and Paul is writing to them. He's responding to, to, to some of their questions. But here's the deal. When Paul is writing to the Philippians, he's not writing from the comfort of his home. He's not writing from a, from a hotel or from a boat traveling to somewhere. He's writing them because he's in jail. He's actually, he's in, he's in house arrest. And Paul doesn't know the outcome of the situation. He knows there's a couple things. Okay, he could get released from jail or house arrest. Or they may throw him into like a real jail, like a dungeon where it's dark and it's nasty and you don't want to go. Or he could, they could put him to death and they could feed him to the lions. So he doesn't know. And what's happened here too is Paul, we all know, has this great ministry. He's planting churches. He's training pastors. People are getting saved. It's also awesome. And then all of a sudden, boom, he gets arrested and it all comes to a halt, and it all stops. And so now Paul has lost all of his mobility, all of his freedoms, and he's, he's lang- I don't want to say he's languishing, but, but, but he's, he's under house arrest. But what we don't see in Philippians is, hey, Paul, how are you doing? And he writes back, please get me out of here. This is a terrible, terrible situation. Would you please send me money? Because I need to hire some lawyers who are going to go to my defense and are going to help me get out of here. We don't, we don't, we don't see that at all. And so there's, a, there's, there's this background that's going on in this letter and this kind of this tension you can, you can feel when you recognize Paul's circumstances, but then you, you read what he's writing, and you're like, it doesn't quite fit. That doesn't line up. Like, if I were in that situation, I don't think I'd be writing the thing that, that Paul writes. So it's, it's a very interesting book in that way. And so as we move on to the scriptures, we're going to be in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, and I'll put it up here on the screen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, you can turn them on, or you can also read on the, on the screen with me. But Paul writes to the Philippians, he's in, under house arrest, and he says, uh, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. We don't know what exactly happened, but I mean, we don't know if the Philippians kind of forgot about Paul or if it's uh, out of sight, out of mind type of thing. But, but for some reason, they, they thought, hey, there's Paul. He's out there somewhere. We need to see how he's doing. And, uh, and what he says earlier is that they sent him a gift, kind of like a, 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 like a care package, I guess. And, so, and then he continues writing on. He says, you were indeed con- concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. We don't know why. Maybe they couldn't get the care package to him or something happened along the way. But finally, something has come about to where it has been sent. And he says, not that I am speaking of being in need. Now, when I was in college, my, my mother, around holidays, Thanksgiving, Halloween, uh, Easter, those types of things, she would send me a care package, and I really liked it. Um, and mom, if you're watching this via YouTube, just want to say thanks for the care packages. <laughs> um, and also, um, when we first arrived on the field, she would send us care packages too. And, and inside them, if it was Thanksgiving, she'd send us some little turkeys or something to sit on, on the table. Not turkey you can eat, but just little, you know, candles or something and some fall leaves and, and candy. And I love the, the candy, especially Halloween. She'd send us Halloween and things like that. And uh, it's, not that I, it's not that I didn't, it's not that I needed that stuff, but it sure was nice. And that's what Paul is saying here to the Philippians, like, hey, I'm not speaking here of being in need, like, thanks a lot. I really appreciate what you're doing for me. I really appreciate the care package. I love the candy that you sent in there, the Roman candles or whatever it is that you sent. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's not that I needed it, but I sure do appreciate it. And it doesn't go unnoticed. And then he, he writes on. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, be content. So your gift has really helped me out a lot because I'm under house arrest. But I want to tell you something. I have learned to be content. And if you're worried that you took a really long time to send your care package and because of that I'm languishing in prison, I'm not. Don't worry because you know what? I've, I've learned something. Well, Paul, what have you learned? I've learned how to be content. I've learned to be content. In any 
type of situation, whatever situation I'm in, if I'm in house arrest or I'm enjoying great freedom, I have learned how to be content. And what's interesting about this is that we tend to think of Paul as just some, some great man who, I mean, of course, he wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament, and he really got the Christian movement started, and, and eventually it just it spread throughout the Roman Empire and through Asia. But, but Paul didn't just come on that naturally. Like, for contentment, he had, he had to learn it. He, was, he wasn't born that way. And for me, that's a little bit comforting, because if Paul had to learn it, and I struggle with contentment, then that means that I can learn it too. And that means that for all of us, that we can learn to be content too. Moving on, he says, uh, he writes, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to, be, uh, how to abound. In other words, he's saying, hey, Philippians, thank you so much for your care package. I've learned something, though. I've learned how to be content. You know what else? I've learned what it's like to be in the worst situations, and I've learned what it's like to be in the best situations. You know what? I can deal with it. I'm in jail. I'm under house arrest, but I can deal with it. And don't forget, too, Paul, I mean, he's been shipwrecked before. So Paul understands what it's like to have everything that he has just, just stripped away from him. And I, I don't remember how many times he was, he was shipwrecked, but there was a couple times where, where they survived, and they had to float to shore holding on to some logs and whatnot. And everything was lost. So whatever he had on that ship, his money, his clothes, any documents, any, any letters that he'd written, all that stuff was lost. And he arrived on shore with nothing on him except for maybe his clothes. And then he had to depend on people to help him out. And then he had to wait until resources came. So Paul's saying, hey, don't forget my history here. I know what it's like to be brought low. I know what it's like to be in the worst situation possible. I've been beaten, I've been thrown in jail, I've had stones thrown out at me, I've been kicked out of jobs, or out of, out of town, and I've lost my job as a tent maker because all of a sudden I had to pack up and, and I had to leave, then I had to go into another town, and I had to start all over with everything. And so, yeah, I, I know how, how to deal with it. But not only that, like sure, I've been in some low situations, but also I know how to abound. I know what it's like to have a lot. I know what it's like to have plenty, to not be in need at all. And we don't know for sure, but, but there's some say, who say that Paul at one time was, was a man of great means. And at times in his ministry when he's really flourishing, he didn't really have to depend a lot on other people. But then there's other times when, when he did. So, so he's saying, hey, I've been a, great, I've been a person of great means at, at times, but you know what? I'm not stuck on the hedonic treadmill. I'm not going around and around and around on these things. I, I'm okay, I'm content, because I have a source of contentment. And one thing that I take courage from this as well is that Paul's not just writing these things off the top of his head. He's not thinking, of, of, okay, I wonder what I can really say to sound spiritual. Um, he's not writing this for himself. He, he's writing this for, for, for their benefit. And he's saying, listen, I've learned to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to, how to have a lot. You know what? You learn you can know these things too. And we can know how to be content when, we've lost, when we lose a job or when we face a sudden change. We can be content when we're, in, when we're in good times or when we're in bad times. And it's in here so that we can know how to be content. Not only that, but when Paul writes this, and he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound, what he's saying to each one of you, what he's saying to the Philippians and to all of the succeeding generations who are going to read his letters is, I get, I get what you're going through. I know what you're going through. I understand, and I can relate with you. I may be the Apostle Paul, but I'm just a man, I'm just a human being, and I have experienced the highs and lows that life has to offer, and I relate. And even though we're separated by two, Whatever time that you're living in, I get it. I understand. I, want, I understand what it's like to not be content, but I've, I've learned a secret. And so this message here for us this morning, here on November 8th, where we are in this time and, and in this age, is so important because the issue of contentment is something that we all struggle with, and people before us and after us, they're all going to struggle with it as well. And so it's, we need to pay attention and learn how to be content. And so Paul, he writes on, he says, in any and every circumstance, it doesn't matter, it's not just one circumstance, it's not just one thing, he's saying it's in any and every circumstance, in every little bit piece of life, 
I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. My kids love to tell me secrets. I've got three boys, 11, 8, and 5. And especially my, my middle child, Lucas. Man, he loves to walk up. Hey, Dad, can I tell you a secret? Lucas, what's your secret? And then he tells me, that, okay, Lucas, I've got a secret for you. Oh, you do? Okay, it's great. And, and, and he loves that. And for some reason, I think there's a lot of things from childhood and our own lives that never quite grow out of us because I like it when somebody who's maybe a little bit more important than me or higher in position comes up to, to me and says, hey, Mike, can I tell you something? Don't tell anybody else. This is just for you. Really? Okay, all right. So now I, like, I have this secret knowledge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to possess something that nobody else is going to know. Okay, well, well, what's your secret? Tell me. And, uh, and then we, we have that, and it's like, oh, we're walking around, hey, I've got my boss's secret, nobody else, nobody else knows about it. But what Paul is doing here to us is, hey, is, hey, hey I've learned the secret. Psst, come here, come here. Come closer. Can I tell you something? I'm going to tell you a secret here. I'm going to tell you how to face plenty, what it's like to have a lot, and then I'm going to tell you how to, be, how to be hungry, how to be, live in abundance, how to live in need, and to be content with all of those circumstances. So, so would, you, would you come here? Would you... Would you draw a little bit closer? Because I'm going to tell you something that's a secret. And he sets us up, through, uh, he sets us up for this throughout the whole passage because he's been saying, hey, I've learned something, I know. And then he says, I know it again. And then he says, I learned something again. And so we're by the end, and he tells us, hey, I've got this secret. It's like, oh, Paul, you've got to tell me. What have you learned? What do you know? What's your secret? So he says, come closer. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because here it is. Here's my secret. And he says, I do all things in him, Christ strengthens me. What's that? I'll tell you again. Here's my secret. I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. Well, wait a second, Paul. I thought that that only applied to sports. Because if you're at least from North America, like if, when you watch football or you watch baseball and you see the Christians out there, they always write this verse, hey, I can do all things through Christ who who strengthens me, and we're going to go out on that football field, and we're going to win this game, and we're going to win it for Jesus. And, and I remember as a, as a kid or in high school, I went on a white water rafting trip up in Colorado. And before we got on the raft and before we, we, we were going to go attack these, these rapids, um, our leader said, okay, I want us to read a verse together before we, before we get in the boat. So, okay. So, and we read it. I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. And yes, that's true. We can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens us. But that's not really quite what Paul is getting at. His secret is that, hey, I've got a secret on how you can be content in all situations and in everything. And as I was preparing this message, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at, at the word secret. I'm like, okay, Paul, okay, really, what is your secret? And then I get to, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I'm like, Paul, <laughs> you're... Your secret here actually disappoints me a little bit because I thought, you know, it'd be really good if I were writing this. If you want to be content in all circumstances, let me give you like, like three, three bullet points or three things that you can do to learn how, how, how to be content in life. And when I get to I can do all things through him who strengthens me, I'm, I'm just like, Paul, oh, that's, there's not much of a secret there. I'm not really sure what, what you're getting there. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You, you just need to remember one thing for your source of contentment, and that's, that's Jesus. Well, okay, yes, Paul, I, I realize that, but if you grew up in Sunday school, and I did, um, if you're sitting there in class, and the teacher an asks you a question, if you answer Jesus, or God, or the Holy Spirit, you're going to be right like 95% of the time. And you could totally have missed the, the, the teacher's question, and you can just say, Jesus. Yes, Mike, you, you're right. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right. And so for me, I'm like, Paul, like this is the answer that I've been giving all of my life whenever I go to, to Sunday school is, is Jesus. And Paul says, I know. I know. But what you don't realize is that I've been telling you this the whole time throughout this book. And, and see, we, we tend to, to look at the Bible as, as a reference book. Okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go play a sport today, and so what's a good verse? Oh, I know. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That'll really encourage me today. Or I've got a question about my marriage, or I've got a question about ethics, or, or how is the world made? And, and so we think, okay, I can just go to this section of the Bible, 
or here, 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 and I can get my answers. And yes, that is true. Uh, we can do that. But for us, it's really important that we understand either the letter that's being written or the book that's being writ- written or the Bible that's, be- that, that's been written within its context and with its entirety. And I think it was last week that Pastor Homer was talking about how important it is that we need to read our Bibles, not just focus on like one verse, and that's definitely a good thing to do, but to really understand from, from, from creation to, to Christ's death on the cross to the end and to really understand the whole of God's story because then you can be like, oh, okay, there's some things here that I see that I never saw before, and now I get it. And now I understand how maybe Philippians fits within the whole story, or I understand how Genesis looks forward to the end, and, and those types of things. And so we need to know our Bibles, and, and not always just, just cherry-pick little things out of it, because that can be a bit dangerous. And so Paul is saying, look, I've been writing this the whole time in Philippians, that, that, that Jesus should be the source of our contentment. And so for us to really understand Paul's secret that I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me, we need to jump back just a little bit. And there's a couple things in Philippians I could pull, back, pull out, but I'm not going to pull them out, pull out all of them. So we're just going to go to chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 9a. And Paul writes this in the chapter before what we've just been saying. He says, whatever gain I had, okay, anything that I could gain, anything that I could get in this life, whatever gain I had, I counted it long for the sake of Christ. Whatever it was, I can, it's a write-off. I can write it off because it's a loss for the sake of Christ. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count it all as loss. Like Jesus is the number one thing here. All, these, all this other stuff, it's just stuff. But Jesus is the main thing. And he says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish. I count it all as rubbish. It, it, it's just trash. It's all it is. It ain't nothing but a thing, the saying goes. In order that I may gain Christ, be found in him. So Paul has learned to look at his life from a different perspective saying, hey, I don't have to be on the hedonic treadmill. I don't have to get, get, get. I don't have to, to change my, my situation. All that stuff, I count as rubbish because to have Christ means everything. And see, here's the rub. Here's where it comes to us today is that the issue for us is that we tend to count everything as gain, my, myself in, included, and therefore we can't be content. And so when we gain something, then we want to gain something else and it's a never ending cycle but Paul saying no 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 you you've got it all wrong like you've got Christ down here you've got your your things and your situations up here you need to flip it you need to flip it and you've got to recognize that whatever it is that you have wherever you may be it's a good thing but it's not the thing it's Jesus he's the one that 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 we're to be focused on he's he is everything to us and he's worth so much more than everything else. And so that's, that's my secret. That's why I'm saying I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's because I have learned that Jesus truly is the source of my content. Because I've been able to put everything else aside and saying that's not what makes me happy. It's Jesus that makes me happy. And you know, Paul... When he was younger, and, and before this passage, he talks about this a little bit, but he said, I was going places. Like, I was a discontent type of guy. And I was going to be the best, the best. He said, I was a Pharisee, but I was going to be a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was not going to only get my PhD, but I was going to be the number one student in my class, and I was going to be better than anybody else. And not only that, because I was such a, a driven Jewish guy, he said, I was going to get rid of the entire church, and that was my mission. I was going to go out, and I was going to make a name for myself. I was a self-promoter, and I was going to get out there, and we were going to clear out all of the Christians from Israel and beyond, and we were going to get rid of this, this new religion or whatever it was, and I was going to be the driver of that, and I was not going to be content until Christians were gone off of the face of this planet, until one day 
Y'all all know probably that down on the road to Damascus, Jesus shows up and a, a light appears and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was his name at the time. He said, who, who are you? Who, who is it? He says, I'm Jesus. I'm the one that, that you're persecuting. And from that moment in Paul's life, everything changed. Now, I don't know that Paul learned how to be content in that one moment. Because I think there's a lot of things in his life that he had to get right and that he had to change. But when he writes, hey, I've learned this, I know this stuff, he's saying, it's been a process for me, but I have learned this point that no matter what my situation is, I may be in jail or I may be really flourished, but my source of contentment does not come from my ministry numbers. My source of contentment does not come from the material things that I have. My source of contentment comes from from Jesus, and it comes from Him and Him only. And so here's my, my, my question for us today. Is that have you come to the place where you can say, Jesus really is your source of contentment? Nothing else is really, really has that much value except for Jesus. Have you come to that point? Where whether or not it's your circumstances, your finances, your living situation, anything, where you can say, you know what? All those things pale in comparison to Christ. And I can truly say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he is my source of contentment. And again, the Christian life is, is a learning process. I, I hope that, that we can move a little bit further on the continuum to, be, to becoming content and to getting off the hedonic treadmill. But I don't know, although it would be awesome, like, all of a sudden we can walk away and, and be content today with everything and never have to, to deal with this issue. But I know me, and that's not usually the, the case for me, and it's probably not for you. But the issue is, is that we keep striving for it, and we, we keep working at it. Because the whole goal is to become more and more and more Christ-like. And so it's a journey, and it's a process. But I'd also like for you to think, too, not just, okay, how, how am I going to put this into place in my life? What steps and what changes do I need to make in my life? Not only that, but... What's it going to look like when I am content, when I do find that Jesus is the source of my contentment? Because it's going to affect a number of things in your life, and I came up with three. And number one is it's going to allow you to enjoy God's blessings. In other words, I talked about my bike earlier. I don't really need to make those upgrades to my bike. Like I can enjoy my bike for what it is, and I can go out there and I can ride it, and I can say, thank you, God, that you have given me this blessing, and I'm so content, and I'm so glad that I get to use it, be out there on the trails, um, and, but, but when we're content, it keeps us from going, oh, I got to have this, I got to have that, and we can focus on what God has blessed us with in the here and the now. Not only that, when our source of contentment comes from Jesus, it demonstrates to your kids, demonstrates to your friends, to your coworkers, that contentment comes from Jesus. Can you imagine if somebody notices at work or something like, hey, I noticed that, that you don't, you don't self-promote like everybody else is. Why is that? You look at them and you say, can, can I tell you a secret? Yeah. All right. Yeah, tell me a secret. Well, okay, here's my secret. It's Jesus. It's the source of, it's the source of my contentment. And what an easy way to open up a, an opportunity to, to witness to them. Or with your kids around the dinner table. Hey, kids, can I tell you a secret? Can I tell you how I am learning how to be content? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because Jesus is the source of my contentment. And lastly, when Jesus is our source of contentment, it, it affects your ability to deal with whatever situation that you're in. If you're in, a, if you're in a difficult situation and it's hard, our tendency is to be thinking of some point in the future when we're like, ah, oh, can't wait to get to that point. I can't wait to get better. I can't wait to move. I can't wait until... And our, our, our eyes are focused on, on the future, some, some disappointment where we think that we'll be happy. And we don't focus on what's going on in the here and now. And when Jesus is our source of contentment, it allows us to put those things aside and say, okay, God, I'm here. There's nothing I can do about my situation. So what would you like for me to do in this time period until things change? And for Paul... It's interesting, as I, as I said earlier, he's not writing to the Philippians, please do something to change my situation. He embraces where he's at, and he recognizes that it's not forever. It, at some point, it's going to change. At some point, it may get better. Of course, it, it may not. 
But he writes in there, hey, I want to let you know something. Did you know that my house arrest has actually led to the whole emperor's guard, his secret service to knowing who Jesus Christ is? It's allowed the gospel to be shared with them. See, if Paul was always trying to get out of jail, trying to bring the lawyers in, trying to raise the funds, he probably would have missed that opportunity. But Paul is able to slow things down, say, okay, my source of contentment here is in Jesus, and even though this is a bad situation, I'm going to make the most of it. And because of that, this letter was written. The Secret Service of the Emperor heard the gospel, and great, great things happened. And so for us, as we're here today, is when Jesus is our source of contentment, then we need to slow things down and look and say, okay, God, I'm not real happy with the situation right now, and I know things need to change, and, I, and, and I'm going to work toward that. But, but in the meantime, I want to honor you and all that, and I want to be content with where I'm at. And Lord, please show me how it is that I can act and how I can respond in this situation until things change again. So what I'm asking for us this morning is, are you content? Are you content with your situation that you're in? Are you content with what you have? Are you content with life? Not why? I would venture to guess it's because our source of contentment is not Jesus. And if it's not Jesus, if he's not your source, then what steps are you going to take to make that, that happen? So that we can all truly say, I can do all things through Christ. He gives me strength because I've counted everything as lost. He is gained. He's the one that I live with. Can I pray for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, passage of Scripture that we uh, get to look at and study and that, that Paul wrote that's been handed on uh, down to us over, over centuries of time. And Lord, it's still relevant to our situation of life wherever we meet, may be, uh, whatever we may face. And God, we want to recognize you as our source of contempt. And Lord, we want to recognize that the world and what it has to offer Although there's a lot of good things out there, they do not compare to knowing you. In fact, Lord, we need to write those things off. And instead of looking at gaining those things, Lord, we want to gain you. So, Lord, help us to do that because it's not easy. It's not easy for me, and I know it's probably not easy for the rest of us. But, Lord, we want to get off of that hedonic trip. And we want to say, Lord, I rest in you. I am content. Or please help us to get to that place. And as we're getting there, Lord, use the situations that we have, that we're in, your glory. Help us to be able to stop and pause and ask you and say, God, what, what, what would you have me be? What would you have me do right here, right here? Or may we see things through your eye. May you always, always.